Well, welcome again to Online Church, coming to you from the studios at Pepperdine University. This is Jeff Walling, and if you've been with us since the beginning, this is the eighth of the lessons that we've been sharing during this coronavirus lockdown when so many churches are online. And whether you're watching this on a Sunday or not, God bless you, and I pray that you've started a good week. Last week was a, uh, was a week with lots of changes as well as numbers, as always. Over three million in the world now have been uh, verified to have coronavirus, and they say there's, of course, many more that have not been tested. The deaths in the United States have gone over 60,000, with over 100,000 cases. One of those this last week was a, a friend, a youth minister who had been in the ministry for years and years and years, named Mike Myers whose daughter Carrie is one of our professors. It hits home when you realize that this is not just something out there. I don't know how many of you know someone who has either been hospitalized with coronavirus or has passed away from it, but all our prayers go out to those who have lost loved ones. In fact, before we begin this lesson, let's take a moment and do that together. Father, we just ask that you hear us as we ask your peace and blessings on those who are hurting. Father, I know there are believers all over the world who have lost their lives and yet have gone on to live eternally with Jesus. But God, there are many, many others who did not know Jesus for whom this virus ended their opportunities on this earth. Lord, bring peace, bring healing, and Father, will you take this virus away? In the meantime, will you give us courage and faith each day and hope, Lord, that one way or another you will see us through we pray that in Christ's holy name, and all that agree say, Amen. Well, one of the big shocks for me this week was the fact that churches have started to reopen. Now, here in California, mind you, that's not taking place. But I know of a friend who preaches at a very large church in Texas who will have their first service, if you're watching this on the first Sunday in May, today. In fact, there's a group calling this Reopen the Church Sunday. Uh, they have a website, and they're saying, hey, we want to encourage everybody to, to reopen. Well, not all states are ready for that, nor are all churches. But churches in Texas, uh, in, in Montana, and other places, they've already opened, already having services. Oklahoma and Georgia. In Georgia now, you know, you can go to a barber and get your hair cut if you need to. Indiana. All of those will have church services at some churches this Sunday. Now, I... Uh, I need you to know that I thought I'd be elated when that happened. I thought I'd be doing the chicken dance of joy. But to be honest, I'm struggling and praying, oh Lord, let this be the right decision for these congregations to begin opening their doors. Let this not be the lead to another rise in the number of cases. Now to be clear, this morning while we're going to talk about this, I am not taking any sides. We're not here to say what somebody ought to do. This is situationally decided, and that's the way congregations work. Each congregation of the Lord's Church gets a chance to make their own decisions. Now, there are other groups like the Lutherans and the, the Catholics in Southeast Texas who have said all of their churches are going to be open, and may the Lord bless them, and may they stay healthy. But in every one of our congregations, there's going to be a lot of uh, questions about churches reopening. So today we're going to talk a bit about that, not about the strategy, strategy for reopening or the logistics of reopening. Earlier this week I was on a Zoom call. It was a, a ministry call with a, a hundred different ministers who Zoomed together, and we gave some presentations here from Pepperdine and other places on how to reopen, what questions you need to ask before you reopen, what about spacing, what about masks, what about baptisms and the Lord's Supper. But today, I just want to ask you, what about feelings? Now, our feelings mustn't overwhelm our faith, but our faith does not wipe away our feelings. And there have been two major reactions, as I've talked to folks this week, about churches reopening. They are fear and frustration, and they're on kind of opposite ends of a spectrum. There are those who are saying, oh my goodness, this is too soon to reopen. You can't reopen yet. And their fears are really driving, for some of them, anger, for some of them just literally fear. 
But on the other end of that is frustration. Are people saying, man, I wish our church would hurry up and open. I wish we could get back together. I wish we hadn't stayed closed so long. So what does a believer do when fear or frustration are grabbing a hold of you by the throat and causing you to say, I just can't handle this? We're going to talk about both of those. In fact, we're going to let Scripture address both of those today. And then one more F at the end. Let's start with the words of Jesus with regard to fear from, this, from the uh, 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Here we go. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? The apostles were facing a great change. Jesus was leaving them. They got this news at the Last Supper. My little children, I'm not going to be with you any longer. And they were freaked out. They'd followed him for three years, and all of a sudden the rabbi, who just finally has seemed to be reaching his full stride, was saying, I'm leaving. Now, they didn't know that he was leaving to go to the cross. Otherwise, Peter would never have said, I want to go too, like a kid whose parents are heading out for a vacation, just the two of them. Now, Jesus said, I'm going, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And knowing what they would feel, he led with these words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, it's one thing to tell somebody, hey, now come on, don't be upset about this. We probably said that a lot during the coronavirus problems. But Jesus goes on to say, here's what you do instead. If you're scared about your church reopening, if you're fearful about restaurants or movie theaters, if you're worried that all of a sudden you might get sick after protecting yourself for so long, if those fears are overwhelming you, because some fears are reasonable fears, but Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He gives us two things to put our feet firmly on. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he's here? Do you believe he will see you through? I hope you can say, I do. And if you don't, I hope you make a choice to make a commitment to Christ, saying, God, I'm going to trust you. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Do you believe in the presence of Christ? Do you believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that that only begotten son so cared for you that he was willing to go to the cross for you? You know, when things change, we react, well, the child in us swarms up. It says, oh, I don't know, I don't know, how am I going to handle this? But I'm, I'm scared. I'm worried. I've got my mask even with me today, just in case somebody came in the studio that uh, I didn't know, that, that I didn't want to get close to. When our fears begin to cause our heart to be troubled, Jesus says, back up and remind yourself, there's a God who loves me, and there's a Jesus who died for me, and we can add one more, there is a spirit who is, in, who is within me, that's why Jesus said, hey, I've gone to prepare a place for you. What if worse comes to worse, Jeff? What if you do get sick? And by the way, we'll all die of something, right? So what if you do get sick? Don't be careless about your health. Don't just go out there and say, well, I don't care. I'm going to hug everybody. But if something were to happen, coronavirus or otherwise, as my brother Mike Myers had his graduation into glory this week, we can all know that through Jesus Christ, we don't have to fear cancer or diabetes or car wrecks or nuclear war or, yes, COVID-19. If fear is getting a hold of you, maybe it would be good to remember an Old Testament text as well. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 and about verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What's interesting is that he says, it's the beginning of knowledge, but I believe that the fear of the Lord is the end of something too. You see, we're all afraid of different things. But when I choose to put my eyes on Christ, when I choose, if you will, to stand in the fear of the Lord, what I'm saying is, God, you are the only one worth fearing. So I'm not going to fear anything else. Well, I'm going to be careful when I drive. I'm, I'm going to be thoughtful about going out with my mask and about being careful during this time of social distancing. But fear, the kind that gets a hold of you and troubles your heart, the kind that takes away your Christian witness, no. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
The proverb writer, many, many, many years before, said, just have the fear of the Lord. Because when you fear Him, you'll never fear anything else in that way. (laughs) Oh, it's been a long time ago that uh, we had some chickens. We lived in Los Angeles, but my dad wanted to know what it was like to be on a farm, right? I thought chickens came in plastic because that's the only ones I saw at the store. And so we had these little chicks. We were raising them up. I had the duty of going around and watering and feeding, which was all fun until one day one of the chickens, a male, a rooster, had got up to the age where when I walked inside the little enclosure where they were in our backyard, he ran at me. I I was scared. I, I jumped back. And then he jumped up and began to flap his wings and pull his little uh, feet up. Now, some of you farmers or folks who have been around chickens know what I'm talking. It's called a flogging. And he started flapping his wings and pulling those feet up. I saw the little spurs on the back and thought, oh, no. I had fallen on the ground. I was scared. That was right at this. uh, This this chicken is demon-possessed and going to kill me, I thought. I rolled over onto my belly and ran so fast into the house. My father was there and said, what's wrong? And I said, well, the chickens, they've gone crazy. He flopped his wings. He was trying to kill me with these pokey things. And my dad looked at me and asked one question. Did you close the chicken wire before you ran out of there? And I realized, no, I'd I'd left it open. That means that chicken could get loose. I thought of that chicken going all through our neighborhood with those pokey things killing innocent children. (laughs) My dad said, Jeff... Go back and put the chicken wire back. Make sure that chicken's in there. I said, Dad, I can't. The demon chicken is out there. And my dad looked at me and said, I'm telling you, go get the chicken back in. I looked at my father and my eyes welled up with tears. I said, no. And he looked at me and said, what did you say? (laughs) Now, All of you who have ever had your dad or mom ask you that question, no, that wasn't a hearing problem question. He was wanting me to know, is that what you really want to say to me? I had to make a decision at that moment. Who was I more afraid of, a chicken or my father? And to tell you the truth, it was a pretty easy decision. I said, Dad, I'm okay. He said, here. He rolled up a newspaper, put it in my hand, and walked me out to the chicken. I was crying, and when I saw him, I got so nervous. And when the chicken ran at me, my dad just took that paper and said, here, boom, knocked the chicken back into the pen. Well, from that day forward, any time I went out to take care of the chickens, I took a rolled up paper, and I knew if I needed it, my dad was my backup. Friends, whatever has grabbed you with fear, Don't let it control your faith. Don't let your hearts be troubled. But instead, there's only one thing we fear, and that's the Lord. And when we become Christians, we no longer have to fear the Lord. He becomes our Father. All right, I got to hurry. That's the fear side. But what about the frustration side? What about the side of how come we can't get our churches open? I had somebody here in California say, well, I wish I lived in Texas. And then I had folks in Texas say, man, I wish we were in California When you feel that frustration, that desire to say, I want things to be different, it's kind of like being a kid, you know? How come I can't have what that kid's got? Maybe we can let David speak into this feeling. Turn over the book of Psalms and go to Psalm 37 with me. Here's here's what the great King David has to say. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. All right, stop a minute. David says, look, when you start looking at what somebody else has got, especially if you feel like, well, how come he's getting that in? He's not even a good guy. Why are they doing that? That's wrong. He says, don't be frustrated. Because if indeed they're making some wrong choices, they'll end up paying for them. But you, rather than be envious of those who are doing wrong and getting away with it, or be frustrated because you're not getting what somebody else is getting, David follows with this beautiful phrase, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I love those words. In fact, that trust in the Lord and do good It's kind of a motto for me. Sometimes when uh, students come in and say, man, 
I've got a question. Jeff, can I talk to you about it? Sure. But I already know what the answer is. Well, how could you possibly? Whatever it is, ask me and I'll say the same thing. Trust in the Lord and do what's right. One of the translations has it that way and I love it. Trust in the Lord and do what's right. You see, if I'm frustrated because somebody's getting something I don't think they should get or doing something I don't think they should do, David's wonderful line, what do you do about that? You trust in the Lord and you do what's right. Some people try and do what's right without trusting in God, and that's going to be almost impossible. Still others say they just trust in God but never get to do what's right. As my grandma used to say, who loved the song, Trust and Obey, she said some people should really sing it, trust and trust and trust and trust, because they never get to the obey part. You might think this is a bit trite. Oh, who could say, oh, just trust in the Lord and do what's right. Well, let me tell you, the fellow that wrote that text, inspired by God, King David, he knew what it was like to be on all sides. He knew what it was like to be the little brother that nobody paid any attention to. What do you do? Trust in the Lord and do what's right. He also knew what it was like to be the hero. He who killed Goliath. What do you do? Trust in the Lord and do what's right. What about when people turn on you? When Saul wanted to kill him? Trust in the Lord and do what's right. But what about when you become the king and you've got all the power and you see a woman you want who's not your wife? Trust in the Lord and do what's right. You see, all along the way in our life, when we're frustrated, when we're angry, when we're not getting what we want, David's words are a pretty good motto. Trust in the Lord. Jesus says you believe in God. Believe also in me. And then take the next right step. Now it's hard to do if you're not trusting. <laughs> I guess that brings me to the close and to Jesus' words. In John chapter 10, Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of trust that we'll finish with. The scriptures there says, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, you need a little bit of context here. You see, Jesus is talking about a shepherd who in the morning has come to his sheepfold. Imagine sunrise in the Judean hills. Here comes the shepherd. The watchman or gatekeeper has stayed up all night long guarding the sheep because there's many sheep in this fold, not just the ones belonging to this shepherd. Several shepherds would go together and there'd be one watchman. So the watchman, recognizing the shepherd, opens the gate. The shepherd then gets his sheep out. Well now, how is he going to get his sheep out without taking anybody else's? The Bible says that he just calls them. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. What a beautiful image of trust. Jesus says, though sheep don't come simply because the shepherd knows their name, though sheep don't come because the shepherd grabs them, here, you come, you come. He just calls them by name, and they recognize his voice. Is there a voice you'd recognize? If in the dead of night, in darkness, in some tragedy, that voice called out, come this way, that you would immediately say, I trust that voice. Recently, my older sister was going through some things in her garage, and she said, Jefferson, I've got something you should have. It was this picture of my father, T.J. Walling. He's probably a good deal younger than I am now. He was a minister, as many of you may have known, and a man who served churches here in, in Southern California. Well, I was looking at that picture and it made me think of my dad as a younger man and, and me as a kid. And it brought back a memory. It brought back a memory of being sick. It wasn't COVID. I think it probably was just the flu, although I really don't know. I just know I was so sick that my mom talked my dad into taking me to the doctor. Oh, I hated going to the doctor. And my father didn't exactly enjoy taking me. I remember walking into the Gallatin Medical Clinic and there being led back to a waiting room. 
you know, one of those rooms with, uh, some of you remember the old metal tables that had paper over the top of them? They were, uh, they were just that paper to keep them sanitized. I sat down on that and, oh, those tables were always cold. They were electrically cool for your discomfort, I'm convinced. Waiting there, I knew what was going to happen. The door was going to open. In came the doctor with a stethoscope around his neck, smiling at me. And he said, well, how are you doing? And I thought, what a dumb question. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't doing well. My dad said, well, I think he's under the weather. Doc might have the flu. So the doctor took his stethoscope that he had just taken out of the freezer and put it on my chest. Breathe in. <gasps> he didn't have to tell me to do that. After a few breaths, my doctor looked at me and said, well, you're a sick little boy. And I wanted to say, well, you're a dumb little doctor. I mean, I knew that before I came in here, bud. But then he said some things that I didn't pay attention to until he got to two words. Penicillin shot. Oh, please, no. I hated shots. Before I know it, the doctor was out getting the nurse, getting the shots. And I said, Dad, he said, you'll be fine. The doctor walked back in, had me lay face down on that table, pulled my pants down, took a little uh, piece of cotton with some alcohol on it and rubbed it, making a little landing zone clean on my rear there. And then I tensed myself up for the shot. Now, I knew I shouldn't tense up. I really should relax, but it was so hard to do that. But just about the time the doctor was going to give it to me, the door flew open and a nurse said, the kid in room six is having a seizure. Doctor, come quickly. Well, we all looked at one another. The doctor dropped the needle in a pan. He and the nurse rushed out, and the door shut. I was left laying there on the table, you know, like a little target, just waiting for him. And it was a bit chilly. I reached down to pull my pants up, and my dad said, nope, stay still. He'll be back in a minute. So there I was, laying on that table, dreading what was about to happen. Sure enough, within a few minutes, the door opened again. Only it wasn't the doctor. It was another nurse, an older nurse, the one that had been there the longest, the one the doctor would trust to give me my shot. Well, this old nurse came in, grabbed up that needle, and said, Dr. Durham said I should give this to you. Don't worry, I've done a lot of this. I thought, I bet you have. And then she looked at me and lied to me. She said, now, this is not going to hurt at all. And I thought, lady, I'm sick, not stupid. Yes, it's going to hurt. In my mind's eye, that needle was about three feet long. But she said, just hold still. I was preparing myself as I saw her hand shaking like this, and I thought, I'm going to get a tattoo. And at that moment, I made a decision. I sized up that old gal and thought, I bet I could beat her in a foot race. All I got to do is get my pants up around my waist, and if I can get off this table and get out that door, we're not that far from my house. Before I'd moved an inch, my dad stuck that big old hand of his right out and grabbed a hold of my hand and said, just relax. Really what he said was, it's all right. It's all right. In Texas, that's just one word. But with that one word, all my fears were gone. That woman could have been coming at me with a samurai sword raised high, and I'd have laid right there if my dad had said, it's all right. You know how the sheep were led into the slaughterhouse? By a shepherd saying, come on now. And one day, that's how the Lord will lead me and you to our final moments. Come on. Just trust me. I hope that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that allows you to say, yes. I trust your voice, O Lord. And just lay whatever fears or frustrations you've got, just lay them down. One by one has done a beautiful version of that song. Lay it down at the feet of Jesus. And we're going to close with that today. May God bless you. And we'll see you next week. Oh. Mm -hmm.
worry, grief and pain Every cause you have for shame Lay it all down Lay it all down When your cares have buried you And there's nothing left to do Lay it all down Lay it all down At the feet of Jesus the feet of Jesus. When we've given up on better days, the memories we can't erase, lay it all down, lay it all down. We've come to feel what we can't explain, there's nothing here that can ease our pain. Lay it all down, lay it all down Filled with all those anxious thoughts And your doubts became your God Lay it all down, lay it all down At the feet of Jesus At the feet of Jesus Jesus.